Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This week, NASA had a big press conference to show off their new spacesuits for the Artemis program. These are, of course, going to ultimately go to the moon sometime in the next decade. Of course, it started out with a big showreel talking about NASA's history in spacesuit design, going through Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and of course, the Space Shuttle program, where they created the Extravehicular Mobility Unit, the EMU, which is pretty much still in use today on the space station as the Enhanced Extravehicular Mobility Unit. But these suits are not designed for zero-g, so they have a new design which will allow the astronauts to walk. This is the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, and it's obviously being demonstrated by one of the engineers that worked on the project. Right away, a lot of people are saying, man, that is ugly. Those red and blue stripes make it look like some sort of Russian spacesuit. And okay, I, I fully expect that these uh, stripes, these colors might disappear because one of the big technical challenges with spacesuits is keeping the astronauts cool, and anything that isn't white or silver is going to absorb more heat. The other suit they introduced was the new Orion Crew Survival Suit, which is a much closer uh, next-generation version of the survival suit used in the Space Shuttle, the, right, the Advanced Crew Escape Suit. So since this is actually closest in ancestry to its previous generation, let's say, um, I'm going to talk about it first. It is obviously, it looks quite similar. It's the same international orange color because this is a suit that's designed to be worn inside the spacecraft and during recovery. If this crew have to abandon ship after landing, then, you know, it will make them easier to find. That's what the color is all about. But it is a pressure suit. It's just not a pressure suit that's designed to be worn on an EVA. It doesn't have the same mobility. It doesn't have all the extra joints. It's got many more soft parts to it, and when it gets inflated, the soft parts actually become hard and rigid because of the, the pressure inside. There, there are a few changes, though, to this. It, it's a little more mobile than the previous generation. Apparently, in a nod to uh, current you know, user interfaces, the gloves now work with touch screens. Now, while this is only supposed to be used inside the spacecraft, it does have to act as an emergency device and it has to be able to get the astronauts home. And that was fine when the astronauts were in low Earth orbit, but if they're potentially going to the moon and have a big hole in the sh their ship, they might have to spend several days in this suit. So they've been spending time making sure that they can survive in this suit for like a week. It certainly won't be comfortable or pretty, but it will be better than dying. So anyway, back to the main suit. Yeah, it looks a bit dorky, but it is actually, you know, there's a good technical reason behind many of these things. First of all, the position of the arms, it looks like they're leaning forward. But the reason for this is that the joints in these spacesuits these days, they're all circular bearings, they're, so they can only rotate in one axis. And what you have here is by moving these bearings forwards, it actually gives them much greater range of motion. If you look back at the Apollo suits, you'll see that the majority of the joints are bellows type joints where you have a, you know, a fabric coating and it's just held in place by wires and that's supposed to minimize the amount of force needed, but you still need to apply a reasonable amount of force to actually move these joints around. The EMU pretty much eliminated that type of joint. It's just circular joints. So you have uh, two on each arm for one at the shoulder and one near the um, elbow. And then, of course, you have the wrist. They don't need any of these things in the legs because when they're floating around in space, they're not really using their legs for anything. But if you're going to be walking around on a planet, you absolutely need to have working legs. You also need a much lighter suit. This suit here is something like 325 pounds. That's like 150 kilograms. And while the force of gravity on the moon is a whole lot lower than on the Earth, it's still not fun to carry around that much extra inertia. So by angling these joints in the shoulder forwards, it actually gives them a significant more range of movement. Now, it should also be pointed out that the upper arm assemblies are actually quite wide, 
And the arm doesn't go in there snugly like it would into an outfit. You know, it's actually, they've got a whole lot of room in there to move their arm around. The thing that does have to fit snugly is, of course, the hands, because that's really what this is all about, is about putting the arms in the correct place. The one place where we do see a non-rotating joint are in the knees, so that they can, of course, do these, uh, you know, squats on stage, which I'm going to say must be really hard given how heavy this suit is. I also think that for this event, they specifically chose the engineer who was shortest to demo the suit compared to the other guy who was probably the tallest person they had on suit on, on hand to demo it. I also want to put it back so you can see how the lower torso and the leg joints work here. So just look at the way that oscillates back and forth to actually get the leg motion needed. Now guess what? This is a suit design called the Mark III that they worked on originally back in the 1990s, but they, they've kind of iterated upon it. And this actually has the same basic motions and everything in it. It has the same basic design and layout in many ways, obviously with newer technology. This layout made it into the Z or Z series of suits. This is the Z2. That design, by the way, that was voted on by the public to be you know, the look of a Mars suit. There was actually multiple different designs available and people chose the least worst. I believe the suit that they demonstrated on stage was the Z 2.5. And earlier in the week, they also put out an announcement to industry saying, after we've done the first few missions, we'd really like it if you could figure out how to build these for yourselves. Uh, the design is obviously modular. You can change out the arms and the legs. And notice, incidentally, that that uh, suit, that helmet, has two layers. You can see the dual layer helmet here. Also, unlike previous suits, there's not going to be a communication system that involves putting a microphone right next to the person's mouth. You're not going to have the Snoopy Cap style communications anymore. I mean, she has this, this little wire in her ears, so I think just so that she can talk and hear what people are saying. But the design is supposed to have multiple microphones and speakers in the helmet. We can do this these days with commodity hardware, so it doesn't make any sense to have these, these special communication headsets inside the suit is just an extra piece of tech that we don't need these days. The unit on the front is supposed to also display the suit status and everything. That they would really like to replace with some sort of heads-up display inside the helmet. It's not clear that that's actually going to happen, but you know that's the kind of thing that they're looking at. That outer dome, by the way, is also missing all the uh, shades and the visors that the regular, the helmet is supposed to have. This is clearly just set up as a stand-in and somebody will have to develop that at some point. But just watching the demonstrations on stage, it's very clear that they have gone and tackled the most difficult problems. That is getting the greatest range of motion available in a pressure suit. And it's definitely a step above what they had in Apollo or what they have in the space station. Uh, the tests actually were, or the demonstrations were all carried out with the suit under pressure. Although it's not clear what level of pressure they used. Part of the project is aiming for what's called a zero pre-breathe suit. That's where the suit pressure is high enough that they don't have to worry about decompression sickness when they start wearing the suit or when they go on EVA. To achieve that, the suit pressure has to be about 55% of atmospheric pressure as opposed to the 30% of atmospheric pressure that's used in the EMU. And having the higher pressure means that many of these uh, joints can be harder to move. The environmental control system in the suit will also allow them to change the pressure by quite a large range so they could start out an EVA at a higher pressure and then reduce it as their body purges out that excess nitrogen. The life support system is also highly modernized. For the carbon dioxide scrubbers, they're no longer using you know, the disposable lithium hydroxide canisters. Instead, they use something called a swing bed scrubbing system where you have a particle bed. It's an amine that will absorb carbon dioxide and water, but then when you expose it to a vacuum, it will lose it. So you have two of these, one of which is performing the scrubbing on the air and the other one which is exposed to the vacuum. And when they're, one is saturated, you flip them around and the one that is now saturated is losing its carbon dioxide. So the life support system can keep running as long as they have water and oxygen. That big pack, by the way, that is how they get into the suit. It's a big door. 
and they just kind of climb down and put their hands in through the arm slots and put their feet straight down. And then someone behind them closes that suit pack back up. You can actually see it better in this other suit that was developed round about the same time. This is the PXS developed by Oceaneering. And again, they climb in through the back and, uh, you know, they're just sitting in the suit. This is very similar to the Russian Orlan design. The cool thing here is that they've been trying to develop a system where that is actually your airlock. So the suit just kind of hangs out the back of the rover. And then when you want to get into it, you open the door, climb into the suit, close the door, and you just unhook yourself and you're walking around. And that's great for the moon. It's great for Mars because all that dust gets everywhere. While the suit port was demonstrated on the Z1, they have apparently removed it from requirements because they want to expedite development as much as possible and it wasn't seen to be needed for the first Artemis missions. So the plan is that they will have suits that will go to the ISS for testing, but those won't be the final suits because they are going to have to harden them against the dust environment. These bearings will have to be covered, they will have to be insulated and protected to make sure that nothing gets inside them to damage them. The suits will have to be tailored for the environment. So even after they've figured out how to do this on the moon, if they want to go to Mars, they're going to have to do another iteration on the design because, hey, the gravity on Mars is a bit heavier and Mars just has a little bit of an atmosphere, but that's enough to mess up the standard cooling system. So they would have to probably redesign the cooling system a bit to make sure the astronauts don't boil in the glorious heat of a frozen Martian midday. So while I don't think this is by any means the final, final version, I think it's great that NASA are taking concrete steps to replace their fleet of EMUs, which are definitely showing their age, and give, to the extent that spacewalks are having to be changed because of lack of hardware. It'll be great if these get to the moon. I think it's going to be a fine successor to the Apollo suits. I mean, they better be. They've only had 50 years to figure out how to make it better. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.